All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 17th day of October in the year of our Lord, 2023. And this is my second video. So uh, I was thinking maybe I should change the title from Thinking Biblically to simply an, an old man with a microphone. <laughs> it's sometimes a little hard to look at your face all the time. All right, and uh, see that you're getting old. <laughs> Oh, the flesh, it just gets older and older and weaker and weaker. Uh, okay, what I'm going to try to do today is uh, I just posted a, vis a, a video about Israel and, and how they need to repent. I mean, they, they have to see their own sin. Um, and they have to realize they're doing the very thing that was done to them 80 years ago, proving they're no better. May God open their eyes. And they want to rebuild the temple. The current government, you know, I didn't realize how, I thought this was like a dead-end project, that you had the, the Temple Mount Faithful, or whatever they called themselves, this little little tiny group of Jews in, in Jerusalem that was trying to get ready for rebuilding the temple. Well, the temple would be a monument to the fact that they haven't accepted the Messiah. What? The, the, the law of Moses is is finished it's fulfilled not abolished is fulfilled it's it's obsolete because the the eternal covenant was brought in by jesus christ and i cannot understand why evangelicals and fundamentalist bible believers are so ignorant of the new covenant i've almost never heard it preached and I sometimes think I'm, I'm getting repetitious when I talk about Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36. But there's so much ignorance. And if you understand that, it will revolutionize your Christian life. You'll know what the sure and certain promises of God are, and you can go to God and say, Lord, I'm not going to let you go until you fulfill what you promised in my life. And it's not health and wealth. It's his spirit, a new spirit, a new heart. Where it says that where God says, I will put my I will give you the desires of your heart. Yeah, that means he will put his desires in your heart. It doesn't mean he will give you the, the desires of your corrupt, sinful heart. He will give you a new heart. So important, so important. And it's where is it preached? It's like We've been deceived somehow, and I think dispensationalism is part of the problem. Uh, the, the people, some, not all, actually I looked it up in Schofield's, uh, the old version of Schofield, uh, reference notes in the reference, his Bible, and in, at least in the section uh, in Hebrews chapter 8, where uh, the, the author of Hebrews is quoting from Jeremiah 31, because it explicitly says there, I'll make a new covenant. A new, as in a completely different kind of covenant. Yeah, that's what Jesus came for. So many people think it's just forgiveness of sins. Oh, no, no, no. That's just the first and absolutely necessary thing. Without, without atonement for your sin, God cannot possibly inhabit you. That would be, well, a pile of ashes if, they were at, if there was even ashes left. No, they, how can the holy God uh, inhabit people that are still, still in sinful bodies, is there sin still present in our bodies? It's in our flesh. People that think they've, they've achieved perfect holiness, are they're suffering from the, the sin of self-deception. 
not truth. All right. So uh, anyway, there was I noticed there's some comments. I I forgive me for not paying too much attention to comments. A lot of them are, well. I, I at one point I uh, sort of tore down and rebuilt, and lost the, the most of my subscribers because I was sort of getting the impression that some of them might be like fake bots uh, that were just being who knows what what YouTube does. You know, it'd be very easy for AI and their system to to pretend to try to encourage you to get the thousands so they can put ads on your channel. I'll never monetize. Never. No. I see now they're they're pushing to to get rid of ad blockers. Hmm. Oh, I hate the ads. But they're not as obnoxious as they are on television, so. Money, the love of money. This society is just wicked to its core, and we don't recognize it because we were born here. The love of money corrupts everything in the United States. It thoroughly corrupted government with the help of the Supreme Court. You know, and now corporations can buy their senators legally. It's called, instead of calling it a bribe, it's a campaign contribution. Considering the need for money in politics, the court is not very wise. There is no wisdom with there's, when there's no fear of God. All right, so I, I want to, uh, I need to look at this. And I was thinking the other day that I would actually like to uh, try to reach out. Of course, well, who am I? Who am I? I'm just this, this old man in his garage that doesn't have enough room for his junk and his books that I don't read anyway. They're just for a reference. And I seldom even reference them anymore. I have one book that's important, and that's in Scripture. Nothing else is really worth reading. Uh, and to try to uh, to refute all the false doctrines in this world is like trying to clean up the Mississippian flood with a sponge. Uh, the vomit of Satan. You know, in the book of Revelation, where he's, uh, uh, the devil vomits out after the, the woman. Uh, to carry her away in the flood. Yeah, it's sort of like that. Don't ask me for an exact understanding of the book of Revelation. If somebody says they know exactly what it means and exactly how to apply it, 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 it if you apply it in general terms, it's not a problem. It's not too hard. But if you want to look for specific fulfillments and what's going on right now and everything else in the book of Revelation, uh, the only thing I can say is, once this happened, we'll be able to see. Hindsight's always clearer than foresight. Um, I do not wish to uh, distort people's understanding. Keep an open mind. That's all I can say. Keep an open mind. I, I would not wash, wish to be dogmatic on the book of Revelation. Uh, it, as, especially when we have people out there that can't even understand what's obvious like turns the seven letters to the seven churches into seven time periods? What is the, what is the you know, dispensationalists are supposed to be so literalists, but they, 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 they turn literal letters to seven literal churches, L little, little letters that John was to write to seven messengers, not angels, that's in spiritual angels, but messengers from the churches to him on Patmos. Just look at the historical circumstance. You should be able to understand, if you have any knowledge at all, you know, about how, you know, jails and stuff worked historically and outside the United States. Uh, you're in exile. You got to provide your own stuff. I mean, so these were seven messengers from the seven churches. These were literally. And what what uh, the message God sent to them, Christ sent to them, was, of course, applicable to churches in general, depending on your circumstance. But it's not seven ages, church ages. This is, this is total invention of people that claim to be literalists, often excessively literal, where it's not being literal. Uh, so, yeah, uh, but we've grown up with all kinds of nonsense. Um, 
just think, it's like this whole issue in Israel, we grew up, if you grew up in church, you went to Sunday school, probably, I don't know what they do in every denomination. I grew up in a Lutheran church, and in Sunday school, you did that, did color pictures and heard stories of, of David and Goliath, of Moses, of Abraham, all these Old Testament people, right? And not so much about Christ and the apostles, but mostly... So we grew up with these things, and we grew up with Israel as being the people of God, and so that's ingrained in us from our earliest days, really. Uh, you know, songs like Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho. Yeah. Yeah. It's all, all literally true. But, and I had a question about this, and, and I'll get to that today, but so let me look at, there's two questions I can deal with really quick. And again, I'd, I'd like, you know, to, for people to ask questions, I need to start answering people's questions, uh, good questions, uh, that, that are, you know, some questions you can just do, do pretty easy. Um, somebody asked me a question four days ago. Uh, I'm not going to read your names. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's amazing how far, but, but this stuff is publicly posted. So <laughs> it's amazing how far dispensationalist tentacles have gone. Yeah. Yeah, because most of us, I think, probably absorbed it without realizing we were being taught a system of understanding the Bible that began with Darby in the early 1800s. Darby had an accident, fell off his horse, apparently on his head. And while he was recovering, he had these revelations. The same year that Joseph Smith had his revelations, too. Just a coincidence, I'm sure, but... I guess it was a good year for the devil. But yes, because it affects anything, and that's why I'm opposed to all systems of theology, because anything that affects our understanding of the Scripture, you've got to be very careful about it. If it comes from human beings, it's going to have errors in it, at best. Fallen human beings, even Christians. We do err all the time. And I, I, I pity you trying to understand my speech. I could polish it up. I could script it. But it wouldn't be me then. So uh, every once in a while I will edit it a little bit because there's be something like, okay, if it, I like just look at a video, I said, well, if I cut it there, rather than go on and on, it's only a half an hour long. And that's the right way to end. I've always had a preacher. I always had a problem with ending. Okay, where do I end? Because I generally speak extemporaneously. Maybe that's wrong, but generally people don't want their pastor be to have a prepared sermon that somebody else wrote either. <sighs> yeah, uh, that was uh, church I was at at uh, in Bismarck, Illinois. They one of the pre the previous pastor. His wife wrote his sermons for him. And he left to go to a church that could actually afford to give him um, uh, pay for health insurance. I can understand that, but really? Uh, you should go where God directs you. The pastors that want a big church, why? Really? They should look in the mirror and ask yourself, why do you want a big church? Are you so much better than everybody else that they have to hear your words? Or are, do you want better benefits and salary? Or are you God's gift to humanity? You know, there, I, I can't think of a really good motive for that. Uh, would you be willing to go and at, to a country church that has 12 people that show up on Sunday morning? Hmm? Uh, Sunday morning, the pastor where I'm going was talking about Christians should get all the education they can, especially if they're going into ministry, which is sort of odd coming from fundamentalist Baptist. Did find out where I went to school. I'm not going to tell you. But I did find out. I, thought, I was thinking there, hmm, the Bible says that where? It doesn't. It doesn't. And uh, one of the things... I have thought about over the years is that if you do that, 
if you go to one of these schools and you end up going into debt to go through college and seminary, so you can't afford to go and serve in a church with 12 people that show up on Sunday morning. Why, is that serving God? So I'm sorry, I've got too many bills to pay. I can't go to your church. You need somebody, but I can't be the guy because I've got too much debt. Or I'm unwilling to work a, a day job to, pay, to feed my family because you can't afford to give me a salary that's sufficient for my six kids or whatever. See, there's problems with all this. The, the way we do things today is not the biblical way. And there's every time you deviate from scriptures here, it's, 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 it's not lethal, but it's not healthy either. So a lot of things are uh, not, on, we sh shouldn't say unlawful, but you know what I mean. They're, they're not something that is, is really wicked, but is, if it hinders you from serving God, like having a lot of debt. What is you? What are you going to get from a seminary anyway? Do, do they believe in the sufficiency of Scripture? Do they practice the sufficiency of Scripture? Or are they going to teach you sociology and psychology and anthropology and all this other worldly stuff that doesn't come from God anyway? What do you need? Aren't you supposed to be delivering God's Word? Where do you find God's Word? In the Bible, and there alone. Don't you already have that? Yeah, are they going to teach you how to understand it better? Not likely. Not likely. And even the, even as far as like Greek and Hebrew, if you simply read the context carefully and know what the Bible teaches so you interpret it in line with the rest of Scripture, you don't need to know Greek. You don't. Unless you're trying to refute people that pretend to know Greek. <laughs> that happens once in a while, but generally not in a church. Generally not. And then there's, you know, you can you can limp along without having formally. You know, I don't, how many years would you have to take to be relatively fluent in biblical Koine Greek? And how do you know the people that taught you actually understand it? Yes, if you listen to James White, you might be led astray. Um... And he actually, uh, unfortunately, I used his example in some ways when I started getting into doing YouTube videos um, because I watched him a lot. Of course, he's gone way downhill since then. But I was looking, you know, how do you do this stuff? I didn't know anything about doing videos. I still don't. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, look at some of these questions here before I waste too much time. Uh, four days ago, it's amazing how far dispensationalist, dispensationalism tentacles have gone. Christian Zionism is a dangerous and foolish position in light of New Testament uh, Christianity. Yeah, I, I did. Uh, where was it? I heard someplace on YouTube uh, from a pretty knowledgeable person. Um, I did hear that Christian di Zionism uh, uh, predates Jewish Zionism by roughly 100 years. Yeah. Well, what happened roughly 100 years before Jewish Zionism, which was the end of the 19th century? The beginning of the 19th century. John Darby, dispensationalism. There was no Christian Zionism before that. Uh, here and there you might have some, um, you know, people that looked at the scripture and, and, and uh, believed that God was going to bring Israel back and I was thinking the other day, I was reading, uh, or quoting, I think, uh, on a, a video, Ezekiel 36, uh, where it's part of the New Covenant, where God talks about bringing his people back. But you have to remember the historical context, too. Ezekiel was writing during the exile, where? In Babylon. So, yes, God did bring people back, and then guess what? The Messiah came and brought in the New Covenant. But what we tend to do with a lot of help from popular Christian authors that are making a lot of money on their, their trash books, uh, their pulp books or whatever, like Late Great Planet Earth, things like that, 
which probably predates most of you. But uh, this popular Christianity stuff, prophecy, people always want to know the future, and you can make a lot of money by telling people what are going to what's going to happen. They'll buy your junk. Just look on YouTube, all the people that, that are just, you know, I want to know, I want to know, instead of opening their Bibles. But you have to, you have to understand the Bible in, in context. So, and realize that some of these things are fulfilled, and everything is fulfilled in Christ. All the Old Testament promises and all the scriptures and the law in its entirety, including the curse, is fulfilled in Christ. The, the Lamb of God who bore the curse, who became a curse for us. It's all fulfilled in Christ. He is the center of all things. He is the creator, and he's bringing all things back. He's restoring what was lost in the garden. Uh, God has a much bigger person, uh, purpose than just the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But so here, uh, Christian Zionism, yeah. Um, because dispensationalism, by what it does with the Bible, distorts our understanding of Scripture. It prevents us from, from seeing the whole picture. And the proper distinction between uh, the law and the new covenant and how different they are, and Christ as being the fulfillment of the old, uh, the new covenant being promised in the old, and even Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob could not come into the presence of God until Christ had atoned for their sin. The Old Testament saints didn't go. Jesus said, no one has ascended to heaven except him who has descended from heaven. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob weren't in heaven. They were in paradise, which wasn't heaven. They could not come into the presence of God because until their sin was atoned for. God can't simply overlook it. He had to take care of it. And he did in Christ. So what they were waiting for came in Christ. We are in a much better position than people in the Old Testament. Which is why I think, why do pastors want to preach out of the Old Testament? Because they can say what they want. Uh, and, but dispensationalism... Uh, does not make the Bible easier to understand. It makes it childish. It makes it, uh, it breaks it up. It, it strips of it of so much of its meaning and richness and depth. And, you know, understanding the depth of things is not a simple understanding. It's not like it's complex, but it's things that are deeper. It requires more maturity and everything else to understand that and time. In time, uh, children understand things at a, at a simple level. Adults have a deeper understanding. Adults can understand metaphor. Little children can't understand metaphor. Dispensationalists can't understand metaphor. Sometimes, sometimes, when the Bible's speaking that way, you know. So, uh, yeah, if you, if you, uh, and then they turn the the seven letters, literal letters to seven literal churches into seven church dispensations. Yikes. Okay, so, yeah, uh, Christian Zionism is, uh, is basically grounded in dispensationalism, and it distorts our view of Israel. Because Israel and the church being separate, we can't, in dispensationalism, and dispensational, and sometimes has Israel having a separate way of salvation. Uh, John Hagee, that heretic from uh, San Antonio, uh, which has been a you know big thing on television for years and years and years. I don't know where he is now, but television, of course, is sort of gone. <laughs> but I'm sure he's on YouTube. Ugh. But anyway, he has completely left Christ behind and, and has been, actually been bought by Israel. You know, when somebody gives you a free private jet, you think Israel do, does that out of the great the abundance of their of their their love for people that are not Jewish? They don't give their own people free jets. They don't give their rabbis free jets. Why? Why? Because he is serving their interests. He's essentially on their payroll. 
not serving the interests of Christ. He's opposing Christ, telling the Jews they don't need to believe in the Messiah. John Hagee does that. Who is he serving? Satan. Yeah, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. And, I, you know, when you read all the Christian prophecy books, you're going to be drinking the Kool-Aid. Because, you know, I, and I don't have everything sorted out. <laughs> okay, so uh, there was another question I wanted to do. So those are, oh, oh let me, where was that? There was another one that was pretty easy to answer. Okay, here, this is a very simple question. Somebody asked uh, three days ago, when I saw all the tanks and artillery, I wondered what the heck they were doing. They were also stationary after firing instead of relocating. Interesting point. I can tell you why. Doesn't make sense unless they were, uh, they keep looping in a show of force, uh, the type of thing. Uh, I know what you mean, but no. Now, the reason the Israeli tanks and artillery do not relocate when they shoot, you know, like the, the typically like the Americans or Russians, say, say Russia, the Russians or the Ukrainians, both, in that system, in that war over there, or special military action, it's not really a war, but it is war. Uh, it's a semi-limited war. Why they, they do what's called shoot and scoot because the other side with radar can pinpoint the firing location of the projectiles. Counter battery radar, it's called. And then there's something called counter battery fire. And of course, they did the same thing back in the Civil War. So the, you saw the cannon shooting at your troops, so your cannon shot at their cannons. So shoot and scoot, you fire and move. Snipers used to do that too. They don't stay in one place and shoot all the time, even in the Civil War, because you could see where the smoke was coming from back then. They didn't have smokeless powder. So you would fire and then relocate, or some cannon rounds would be coming on your location. Being a sniper is very dangerous. Uh, but yeah, they, they would quickly move before the uh, the stuff come, sorry, come back at them. Why does Israel not do that? It's very simple. Because they don't have to. Hamas does not have artillery. Those rockets that Hamas fires couldn't hit the broadside of a barn at a thousand yards. They're very crude. They're like what the British had when they bombarded um, what uh, the Congrave rockets back in the uh, War of 1812, when they bombarded the fort, you know, the Star Spangled Banner by the rockets' red glare, they couldn't hit the broadside of a barn either. Either they are, they are grossly inaccurate artillery. They're not accurate at all. Uh, so, and those ones sometimes uh, Iron Dome doesn't intercept them properly because the rockets wobble all over the place sometimes when they fire. So the computer can't project, project a, a course to intercept because they don't know where they're going to be. But yeah, they don't have to. They don't have to shoot and scoot because there's nothing accurate enough to fire back and hit them. So they, they, they can, yeah, the uh, Hamas could fire a barrage of rockets in the general direction. And some of them might land within several hundred yards, maybe. They don't have to. They don't have to move. See, they're, they're just uh, Hamas and, and Gaza. Let's just say, they're not firing at, at Hamas, they're firing at Gaza. It's a sitting target, a, a sitting duck. It's a city. And they don't care where the shells land in the city. Israel's demonstrated that over the years. They don't care. I mean, when you use white phosphorus, and I can remember when I saw it back in, when was it? One of the many. Israel has bombarded Gaza so many times. Israel has a policy of grossly disproportionate punishment. They punish an entire community, an entire city, 
for the acts of one. I saw that when I was over Israel. They had locked down an entire community, uh, locked down the entire business district, locked it up, because somebody had attacked a soldier with a knife. So rather than going after the one individual, they punish the entire community. That's they've always done that. That's all. That's that's a war crime. Violation of international law. Can't do that. It's the kind of stuff the Germans did. Uh, partisans would would uh, blow up a train or or kill a soldier or something like that. So the Nazis would, would grab 20 people out of the town, line them up, and shoot them to discourage the partisans. So every time you kill one of ours, we'll kill 20 of your townsmen. War crime. I think everybody would think. The Israelis doing the same thing. Yeah, they don't have to move the guns because nobody can harm them. So you wonder why Hamas resorts to the kind of things they can, they do sometimes. That's all they can do. See, it's not a uh, even fight. The terrorism is a strategy of the weak, because it's the only thing they can do. They cannot meet them, you know, uh, man to man on large scale. They don't have the resources. It's amazing they were able to do what they did, which I'm not approving of, under those circumstances, locked up in that. They've been in that ghetto, in, locked, walled up in Gaza for decades and decades. They can't leave. They're prisoners. And Israel doesn't, you know, just barely gives them enough to survive. They've been under siege for decades now. Since Hamas was elected, See, Hamas is the govern, government there, too, and the, the charity organization, everything else. They are not simply a terrorist organization or a military that uses terrorism, like Israel does. They are no more a terrorist organization than the, than it, the IDF is. America uses terrorism, too. We just don't call it terrorism. America has used indiscriminate bombing of civilians and civilian in infrastructure. Go back and look at what they did in the Iraq War. Smashed everything. Power plants, water plants, sewage plants in Iraq. Destroyed it all. Anything that... They didn't care about the civilians. The United States did not care about the civilians. This was before 9-11. Back in the first Gulf War under George uh, George I. So, yeah. Uh, now, so that was a pretty easy question to answer. Okay, here's a difficult question to answer. Not because it's so hard, it's because it takes more time. Uh, 16 hours ago, it would be beneficial if you uploaded your understanding of Israel and the church. Well, I can tell you exactly where to find it in the Bible. In other words, what's the continuity between the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints? Jesus Christ. How's that for an answer? The Old Testament, okay, let me, let me, before I get into a little more detail and where you'll find the real answer so you can find it in Scripture yourself and become convinced that God teaches this instead of just this old man with a microphone. Okay, first of all, in the Old Testament, people were not saved because they were physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not all of the people in the wilderness were, or in the land. There were people that were not physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There were people that came out of Egypt that followed Moses. Uh, at one point, he married an Ethiopian woman, I believe, later, uh, after his first wife died. Uh, 
that was not of Israel, and he was criticized for that. God's prophet. <laughs> okay, so, but there was others, and you have Rahab uh, from uh, Jericho, right? A descendant, uh, an ancestor of Jesus Christ himself. An ancestor of, of David. And, of course, you have Ruth, a Moabitess, ancestor of David, very close ancestor of David. Uh, and, of course, they're all ancestors of Jesus Christ, and they weren't physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Arabs are descendants of Abraham. So the Palestinians, and by the way, the Palestinians are not Philistines. That's a lie that's often uh, promulgated by Christians and others. Because Why? Because the Philistines were the enemies of God in the Old Testament. Enemies of Israel. They are, they are not the, the Palestinians. The, if you want to find the, the local ancestry of the Palestinians, you go back in the Bible, in the area of Moab and uh, the areas around there, which were also descendants of, let's see, um, well, at least sort of descendants. But, uh, of course, you had uh, Ishmael, uh, who was Abraham's son, too, but did not inherit the promise. Right? Ishmael. God promised that he would be, uh, you know, that through that he would also be the father of many nations. So he did not did not have any of the promises of God. Go back and read the scriptures. So you have lots of people in that area that are descended from Abraham. The Arabs claim descent from Abraham. Is there any reason to doubt that? Not really. And when you talk about Arabs being anti-Semitic, I heard that the other day. Somebody accused the Arabs of being anti-Semitic. The Arabs are Semites. Arabic and Hebrew are Semitic languages. Those are the, the people in that area are Semites. So how can, how can an Arab be an anti-Semite? <clears throat> All right, so um, so let's get to this. Yes, uh, this is important. What is a continuity? In the Old Testament, you have the promises of the New Covenant, the promises of the Messiah, all the way back to the Garden, that the seed of woman would crush the head of the serpent, the promise of a Messiah. And all through the prophets, Moses spoke about one who would come, that was like unto Moses. And everyone who would not hear that prophet would be cut off. Well, the Jews asked uh, John the Baptist, are you that prophet? And they said, and he said, no. Who is that prophet? Christ. The one who, like Moses, would bring in a covenant, only a much better covenant. You can read about that in particular in uh, uh, Hebrews which that book sort of assumes an understanding of the Old Testament. But you can get through it. It's He quotes specifically from the promise of the New Covenant given in Jeremiah chapter 31. And it explains how much it is a much better covenant. And it was about uh, trying to warn Jewish believers in Christ not to be, because they were under pressure and persecution, not to go back to the temple and the law, because there is no salvation there. That was simply a type and shadow of Christ. And the current government in Israel, much to my chagrin now, is planning on rebuilding that temple. This, that's what triggered what happened on Saturday. What was that, the 7th? But they, on the 5th, they provoked, they knew the uh, Ben-Gavir, the minister of 
internal security or national security or whatever, or whatever he wants to do, deliberately went up there with a group of radicals and settlers, essentially claiming sovereignty over the Temple Mount, El Asca, the what they call it the mosque, but its entire top of the the, the entire pavement uh, where the Jewish temple once stood. And I've heard people say there's no archaeological evidence that there was a temple. That's a bunch of bunk. I've been there. I've stood on the site. I know the scriptures. Yes, that is where Jesus walked. I sat on the steps that Jesus would have gone up into the temple. So we've got, we've got all kinds of ignorant people out there in the world that, that don't, do not know God or, the, or anything anyway. So, yep, there's, that was, it's pretty, you know, when you actually see the, oh yeah, this is what the Bible talks about. And I could pretty much tell you where it stood. A bit of a guess, but probably slightly north of the uh, Dome of the Rock. Of course, that whole area was but uh, leveled, but everything's probably on the same found, you know, the same kind of foundation areas. But yeah, that was the Romans just flattened the whole thing, especially after uh, uh, was it one thirty five, the Second Jewish Rebellion. They had it, and they built a a pagan temple up there. In fact, there's some thought that the Dome of the Rock is actually built on. Uh, Roman foundations. Of course, you can't do any archaeological digging up there. Although Israel has been digging under the mount. There was a lot of complaints in the past about that. So there's... Uh, uh, I don't want to get too far off on that subject without answering your question. But, uh, you know, I, I, I've been thinking that perhaps we, you know, when we start talking about uh, Muslims and Jews, we we can. You know, uh, uh, Trump, of course, had his Abraham Accords, and it was based on common ancestry, going back to Abraham. Uh, so, uh, assuming assuming the, the Muslims claim to be worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the same God, they'll they'll say we we worship the same God. They'll usually say to Christians, we worship the same God you do. I remember some Ar Ar Iranians when I was in the Air Force uh, in a, the same classroom I was in. We had uh, Saudis and Ar Ar <laughs> that was before the, the Iranian Revolution. Uh, the overthrow of the Shah. Said, I remember one of them said to me, we worship the same God you worship. That was before I was born again. <laughs> Uh, otherwise, it would have been a much more interesting conversation. I didn't have, I was totally ignorant of Islam. I was totally ignorant of God, pretty much. But yeah, it's, uh, I, I'm actually curious because one of the, the dogmas of um, Islam is that God has no son. Inside the Temple Mount, uh, the Dome of the Rock, the, the dome thing, not the mosque, the dome. The mosque is all the way down on the southern end of... Uh, uh, the mosque was not where the temple stood because that's an area, an expanded area that uh, a fill that Herod the Great put there in order for him to build some buildings, uh, colonnades, uh, beautifying the... He, he was a big builder. Uh, but the temple definitely stood north of that area. So, you know, the, the, the El Asca Mosque properly, where the building they worship in, is uh, not where the temple stood, but it's right, right down on the, by the, right above the Wailing Wall, or the Western Wall, which is Retaining Wall. Not the temple, it's a Retaining Wall from Herod's building program. Uh, but yeah, uh, but the, uh, the Dome of the Rock, says in there inscribed on the walls on the inside is God has no son because it's anti-Christian propaganda is what it is. It was built as a rebuke of Christians because the Christians had these grand uh, churches in Jerusalem 
in the year eight uh, when when it was conquered in roughly 800 and uh was it Suleiman the Magnificent I can't remember who did it but he built that dome of the rock it's not a mosque as a piece of anti-christian propaganda to compete with the churches <laughs> for for your enlightenment i guess but yeah, it, and it just says God has no sons. So, but what, is, what do they mean by that? What do they, and, and certainly it's repeated throughout the Quran, at least three times, I think, in the Quran that God has no son and it rebukes the Christians for, for believing that Jesus Christ is God. But what, is, what was Muhammad's understanding of the incarnation? Was it some gross pagan idea uh, of God like Zeus taking the form of man and uh, raping a woman or something like that could be i mean that's what you read in pagan mythology and zeus was often coming down or, or jupiter the the roman version and uh stealing women and impregnating them and having children of men that way hercules was an example of a of, of that kind of thing suppose you know of course this is all mythology but uh, unless you look in the Bible where it talks about, you know, the, the angels cohabiting with women and producing the mighty ones of old. I'm not going to say anything about that because I know no, no more than the scripture says, and I'm not going to speculate on that at all. But I'm going to say if, if, if God's, if, if it actually, if it is what it says it is, then it happened. Who am I to say what angels can and cannot do? <laughs> especially in violation of the will of God. So, but uh, uh, in this case here, but so what do, what do they mean when they say God has no son? In what sense? Do they, it, I, it's highly, highly doubtful that Muhammad had any understanding at all of true Christianity. And what Christians believe, biblically, Bible-believing Christians believe about the Incarnation. And even we have problems talking about the Incarnation. All we can do is say what the Bible says, what it actually teaches. And you know, even if you go to the theologians, even if you go to Bavink, one of the reasons I bought that is that set of Bavink, four volumes, uh, would be say, okay, what does he say about the Incarnation? I was curious. Does he know something I don't? No. Nope. They don't want to talk about it generally. There's very little in theology books about the Incarnation. Because it's such a mystery. How can God become a man? But he did. Because God has revealed to us that he did. I mean, we, we can't analyze God. We're only human beings. One of the important things you have to understand is God is God, and you're not. <laughs> you're not God. So uh, here, as far as Israel and the church, okay, so where do you look? Where do you look to find that? Romans 9, 10, and 11. The book of Hebrews and Gal Paul's letter to the Galatians. Those are the main places. But Romans... In Romans, he goes on for three chapters about this subject. So let's go over there. I'm not going to go through all three chapters. It would take too long, especially for me. So, but, but he's talking that for those three chapters, he's, the question is, if Jesus is really the Messiah, and that's, that's what he's dealing with, if he's really the Messiah and the gospel is really true, why has not... Israel, the majority of Israel, believed. Why is God's own people not believed? It's just like John says in chapter 1 of, of his gospel. Uh, he came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as did receive him, <coughs> <coughs> to them he gave authority to become the children of God, the sons of God. So, uh, not of course, and Paul makes that very point that just because the majority of Israel did not receive him, 
doesn't mean that God's word is not true, of none effect. And he makes a point that that not all Israel is Israel. So not all that are physically the descendants of Abraham are truly the Israel of God. So what makes you the part of the Israel of God? Say in the Old Testament, you had people that were not of Jewish origin uniting themselves to God's people. Being God's people is what makes you people of God. Do you trust in God, in the God of the Old Testament, in the, who is the God of the New Testament? Did you have faith in Yahweh, Jehovah, Elohim, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Did you believe his promises? Did you listen to his prophets? All throughout the Old Testament, those people were God's people. The rest were cut off. Uh, when God gave his people Judah over to the Babylonians, the southern kingdom, you see in Jeremiah that God sent an angel through the city to put a mark on the foreheads of those who wept and mourned over the sins of Jerusalem. He marked his people for preservation. He said, and then he told other, other angels to go through and slay them all, except for those who had the mark. We see something like that in the book of Revelation, don't we? Not the mark of the beast. The, mark, the name of God on their forehead. 144,000. So the believing ones, Old Testament and New, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob believed God. Sometimes they were rogues, but they still believed God. They were not saved by obedience. They were saved by faith. Like David. David was in a, had committed an act of adultery and murder. But yet, God did not execute the law on it David David was uh, spared the the what the law required the law required both him and Bathsheba be executed they weren't they were they weren't stoned to death what did God do God was looking forward to Christ not that David got off scot-free but because David trusted in God blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. It's like Abraham. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned unto him for righteousness or into righteousness. God treats faith in him as what's important. What is saving? You're saved by the grace of God through faith. Faith in God's promise. Well, God's promise is Christ himself. Okay, so let's look quickly at the scriptures. Okay, where are you? I got to get the right window up on the screen here. So, I'm going, now see, if you go back to chapter, again, it's chapter 9, he, Paul talks about this whole issue of Israel and the church. And then in chapter 11, he sort of gets down to the issue of the Gentiles. Okay, where do the Gentiles fit about the, in the continuity of this? Obviously, at Pentecost, you have what? The early church was all Jews. All Jews. Until Cornelius. The Samaritans were half Jews. So they weren't really new. They weren't really outside the covenant. They worshipped they worshiped the God of Israel. They just didn't do it in Jerusalem. Uh, they had their own version of the Old Testament law, the, the Samaritan Pentateuch. But, uh, and it's still around to this very day. So are, I think last I heard, there were still uh, some Samaritans. Well, that was a number of years ago, but, uh, you know, in the area of Samaria. So, uh, and they still practice things like animal sacrifice. They were like old, Old Testament Jews. They were much more, consistent with the Old Testament in modern history than modern Israel. And in fact, 
Israel wouldn't really have to rebuild a temple to do, do sacrifices, but I don't want to go into that. They wouldn't be any good. See, they'd be blasphemy. God's already had the perfect sacrifice for them. He, he provided. Uh, I want to bring this up because it's important. Remember the Old Testament. Remember Abraham. God told him to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice. Isaac, the promised one. Isaac, who was the fruit of not only Abraham, but Sarah, the, the child of promise. You will, your own son will inherit the promise. Okay, And it wasn't going to be uh, Ishmael, which was Abraham and Sarah's plan to fulfill God's promise. No, God was going to do it his way. But Ishmael, again, did get promises from God that he would also be the father of many nations what we call the Arabs, apparently. So, but remember what happened. That Abraham, now where was I going to go with this? Oh, get off on a rabbit trail and lose your direction. But, uh, um... See, even, even with Abraham... Well, first of all, God promised Abraham that he would he would have his own son, and he would multiply his his seed, and his descendants would be like the the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea. Well, we find out in the New Testament that all who believe in Christ are the children of Abraham, not just Paul's writings. We're all Abraham is the father of all believers. So you have people that are physically descendants, but Paul makes his point in this text that, that the, not all Israel is Israel, that just because you're a physical descendant doesn't mean you're actually part of the Israel of God. It's, do you believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Just like in Israel today, there are, when I was there, half of Israel was what they were called secular Jews. They were atheists. Many of the founders of Israel were just plain old atheists. The Zionists, the original Zionists, they were atheists. It had nothing to do with God. Their Zionism had nothing to do with God bringing them back to the land. They didn't believe in God. So are they really Jews? No. The, the weird thing about Israel today, modern Israel, is that it, the Supreme Court at one time, if I rem remember right, ruled that if a Jew became a Christian, they were no longer a Jew. But if a Jew was an atheist, he was still a Jew. A Jew could be a, a Hindu and be a Jew. But a Jew can't be a Christian and be a Jew. But the New Testament says that Christians are the real Jews because we are children of Abraham through faith. Just like Abraham was, was justified through faith. Oh, and circumcision is a sign that justification is by faith, like Abraham. That's what Israel is supposed to understand by circumcision, by the way. But so Paul here in, in chapter 11 of Romans sort of gets down to the nitty-gritty about Gentiles, uh, believing Gentiles, and Israel. Again, uh, Stephen in the New Testament in Acts refers to Israel in the wilderness as the church in the wilderness, the congregation. Ecclesia is those who are called out. We are called out to God. Israel was called out of Egypt to God. So they're, they're, the idea that the church is the, the church is new in a sense because it is the believers under the new covenant. Christ has come. But it's still believers. The believers are the ones who are saved, both Old Testament and New. That's the continuity. Faith in God. We're saved by faith. We're justified by faith. Old Testament and New. Abraham was justified by faith, not by works, by faith. And God provided a sacrifice in place of Isaac. Remember that? that the angel stayed Abraham's hand when he was just about to, to sacrifice his son and said, this is an interesting passage too, 
uh, now I know that you fear me. And God provided a substitute for Isaac. There was a ram caught in the thorns, which is a perfect picture of Christ, the Lamb of God, substituting for Abraham's son, the gospel preached to Abraham. And I've heard preachers go through that passage, and they are as blind as a stone. They don't even mention it. How can you miss that? What are you, stone-cold literalists? I mean, you can't see the picture God is painting? That, that is bad literalism. Abraham actually did what the Bible says Abraham did. It's not a, a made-up story. Literally true. But the meaning there is literally true in the sense that the God is, is providing a picture to Abraham of a substitutionary atonement for his son, too, that God provided the ram. Here, you can sacrifice that instead of your son. Still do a sacrifice. Okay, so here, Paul in Romans 13, the apostle says... Uh, in fact, he gives an interesting promise here, too. He talks about, uh, the, to the, now he's speaking to Gentiles. And he's saying, uh, he's, first of all, he's, 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 David is talking about unbelieving Jews here. He says, and David says, let their table become, uh, become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so they do not see and bow down their back always. This is about unbelieving Israel. Okay, and now talking about the entire nation, Paul says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. I say, that, now if their fall is riches for the world, for the world, the, the you know the world of uh, non-Jews, and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them, say, uh, in the Old Testament, Paul quotes someplace here uh, this very. Uh, passage that I think Isaiah says, though Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant shall be saved. Just because you're a physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob does not mean you're a child of God. By faith, whether you're a physical descendant or not, even in the Old Testament, this was true. So the, 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 the continuity between the Old Testament and New Testament is salvation by God's grace through faith. Who called Abraham out of the dark lands of, of Chaldea? God did. God called Abraham. And Abraham believed God and followed. And then God promised something to him, that his descendants would be as the sand of the seas. And in him, in him, in his seed, singular, go to Galatians, you'll find out about, it really goes into the, the singularity of the seed, not plural, but not seeds, but seed. All the world would be blessed. Well, the seed of Abraham, it's this promises are to Abraham and his seed, singular, that is to Christ. He is the seed of Abraham. He is the one who fulfills the law, who fulfills the promises. In him, all the promises of God are yes and amen. So, you know, that's, so salvation is by grace through faith in Christ. Not by faith alone, as in, in anything, but in Christ. To, be in, to believe in Christ is to be in him. To trust in him. To, to truly believe in him is you will be born again. Salvation is by faith in Christ. Which is Paul's theme all through. So this is what we see today in Israel today, unbelieving Israel. David's curse on them is present. Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense, a payback to them. Let their eyes be darkened 
Yeah, they are. In fact, I just did that video. I said, Israel, are you so blind? They are. But not forever. Certainly not, but through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. We are the witnesses to Israel. We should be living as God's people, that they become jealous. <clears throat> now, if their fall is riches for the world, I know I'm repeating this, but is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. Back in chapter 9 is where he, he t starts talking about he, he, he would be willing to be accursed of God himself if he could save some of his kinsmen. But of course he can't because that was Christ who became accursed for, to save them. But it's the spirit of Christ in Paul. It's the same spirit Christ had. But Christ, of course, was a sacrifice, not the Apostle Paul. But the same, the same spirit that's in all of us who are his people. For if their cast away, being cast away is the reconciling of the world in Christ, through faith in Christ, reconciled to God, God reconciling the world to himself. What will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Well, we read in the prophets that are in the New Testament too, that when, when Christ returns, they will recognize that he's the one they crucified, the Messiah. They will recognize their Messiah when he returns. And God will send them a spirit of repentance. They will mourn for him, for what they did. And then all Israel shall be saved. All Israel. Who's all Israel? All the believing ones. Both Gentiles and Jews. In Christ there is no Jew nor Greek. No, no, no Jew nor Gentile. All these distinctions are done away in him, summing up of all things in Christ. If the first fruit is holy, the lump is, uh, is also. So they are descendants of Abraham. If the root is holy, so are the branches. Talking about Abraham, and Christ is the, the, the seed of Abraham. Jesus is, is called in the Old Testament both the offspring and the root of David. Figure that one out. So he's not only the offspring of David, he's the, 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 the underneath. He's what David springs forth from. Both the root and offspring. That's because he's both God and man. He's both the descent. In fact, I think Jesus uh, uses that very scripture in some ways to, to throw a wrench into the Pharisees. How then... And if, uh, now here, so here we have Paul's illustration of the olive tree of God. This is where the scriptures explain. If you want to find out the explanation for the gospel, the explanation for salvation, these things, is, we look to Paul in particular because God shows him to do a lot of explaining for us, more so than any of the other New Testament writers. He is the, the God's explainer-in-chief. Uh, <clears throat> if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree, not a, a cultivated olive tree, which is Israel, were grafted in among them. This is my understanding right here. And has been since I realized dispensationalism was wrong. This is what showed me that dispensationalism is wrong. Because they have Israel and the church separate. No. The believing ones 
are the cultivated olive tree. Goes back to the Old Testament. Goes back to Abraham. And perhaps before that, if you want to go back, but as far as a people going back to Abraham and the promise of his seed, singular. See, it was all looking forward to the seed, which is Christ. So you, so you talking to the Gentiles, specifically talking to the Gentiles, you being a wild olive tree or wild branch from, a, from another tree are grafted in. He's using a, an agricultural example. You can take a, a branch from one tree, cut it off, and graft it in to the other tree, and it will grow. It will bind itself on. They, they will heal, and you will have a... Uh, so, say you could have a golden, delicious apple. They do this with apple trees a lot. Branch grafted into a Macintosh apple tree. Might taste slightly different, but uh, it's still a golden, delicious apple branch, but it, it, it partakes of the life, the sap, the energy, the nutrients of the Macintosh tree. Crafting. Grafted in. You become part of that tree. Truly a part of that tree. Even if you are not by nature of that tree. From a different tree, from a wild olive branch, a wild olive tree. And with them become a partaker of the root and fatness, fatness of an olive tree, the olive oil, of the olive tree. See, we are Gentiles. We were dead in trespasses and sins, strangers from God, aliens to God. Read the first two chapters of Ephesians. And he has taken us, these foreigners that were apart from him and has grafted us into his people, his olive tree, and the root of that olive tree is the seed of Abraham, Christ himself. We are grafted in, we are one people in Christ. Paul explicitly teaches this over and over again. There's no Jew in, or Greek. We become one new man in him. The new creation. The new birth. The new covenant. We are a new people. Neither Jew nor Gentile anymore. In him. And when he, when he comes, it will be obvious. It will be obvious because we will be glorified together with him. Do not boast against the branches, the natural branches, or the cut-off branches here. It, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. So, uh, Gentiles, we are not by nature uh, partakers of the promises of God. We are through faith, just like Abraham was. Through faith in Christ, we become part of God's people. But the Jews come the same way now, through faith in Christ. And that's the only way of salvation. There are not two courses of salvation. They also have to come and ark and can come. It's open to them. All they have to do is repent and believe. Repent of their own belief and believe in Jesus Christ, their Messiah. Yeshua HaMashiach, their Messiah. Doors open anytime. God is not to shut the door to them. They've hardened themselves through unbelief. And right now, who's, who's the one that, that has the promises of God? Who's the one that has the gospel for the Jews? We do. We do. We <clears> do. <throat> 
But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. True. True. Through, through Israel's unbelief, we got grafted in. The gospel went to them first, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. Most of the Jews wouldn't accept it. So God said, hmm, I think I'll send Peter to Cornelius. God opened. God's plan was bigger than Israel to start with. It was always, you know, to, to bring humanity back from the fall in the garden. Christ is the answer to the fall. God's plan is he's not going to let the devil win anything. Undo the damage. And in the process, display himself. Display his, his mercy and his grace in a way that would never have been known in any other way. Not as an abstraction, but as a demonstration of his grace. As Paul says, the church, we, the believers, are made a spectacle to the angels. God's version of his passion play. We are display to the angels of God of the attributes of God, of his mercy and his grace and his love, even to the point of becoming a man and dying on the cross for sinners. They had no way to know it except through us. It's part of God's plan. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off, but you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Consider, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but toward you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. What does that mean? And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief. So if you do not continue in faith, if you reject Christ, as is very clear in Galatians uh, and in Hebrews, see, without him, you're nothing. You don't possess eternal life as a standalone. You only possess eternal life and the blessings of God in Christ. So if you were to, let me before somebody gets too panicky here, if you divorce Christ, he will divorce you. If you deny him in that kind of a way, utterly reject him, finally reject him, say, no, I'm done with this, and you mean it, and uh, you, no, you never repent of that, uh, then you're, you're toast. You're, you're, the, the one saved, always saved, well, you were never saved enough to, to, to maintain your faith, then. Uh, the Reformed view is actually better, the perseverance of the saints. Although, in some ways, their way is off, too. But if, as long as God will enable you to persevere in faith, through faith, you trust him to keep you. And so even when, you, when, we, uh, when we, um, we, even when our faith fails, he remains faithful because he, cannot deny himself. He cannot deny his faithfulness, even when we fail. But, if you were to, as I said, divorce him, well, don't go there. There's reasons why warnings like this are in the Bible, because God wouldn't say this if it wasn't possible. So when, when a man-made doctrine says that you can deny Christ, you can you can Totally, you can become a Hindu or a Muslim and unrepentantly and go off and live in a crazy lifestyle uh, in utter rebellion against God, uh, utter unbelief. Well, you're not saved. <laughs> Whether you once had faith, Jesus tells a parable about the seeds, right? The parable of the seed. Not all the seed bear, bore fruit. Uh, some of it died. So 
those are warnings are there for a reason. We don't have to be panicky about it. If you know Christ, you know your salvation is in his hands. So don't get too don't but but for people that that reject him, he said, if you deny me, I'll deny you. So if you want to divorce, see, when when a when a divorce takes place in Judaism, the, the man says, I deny you. I divorce you. That's what Jesus is mean. He's, he doesn't mean like a a weakness or a, a you know you, you're in in anger or something. You, you get mad and no, he means willful, deliberate rejection, like a divorce. I don't want people to be frightened that oh, I might do you know like a. A person that's afraid, oh, I might end up in a, in a nursing home and I'll lose my faith. God knows. God is not an idiot. God is merciful. He's compassionate. He knows our weakness, okay? He knows that our brains don't always function properly. You think he's going to, because a, a person has got Alzheimer's and all kinds of things going wrong with them, that, that he's going to reject you because... No, no, God knows. He knows whether his spirit still dwells in you, and it will. Regardless of your brain, his spirit will still dwell in you. He won't abandon you. If you don't have the capacity to abandon him willfully, deliberately, not in ignorance, but he's not going to abandon you. Don't be fearful. He did not send his son into the world to, to condemn people, but to save them. So, but we have to remember, there's, there's, you know, we have to continue in, in belief. We can't deliberately reject him. Like, like Hebrews is about, you know, rejecting Christ and going back to the law. Galatians is about rejecting the sufficiency of Christ and adding the law. Because you don't believe that Christ's uh, sacrifice is sufficient. Believe in bad doctrine like that. But cut yourself off from him because it's Christ alone. Christ plus is in Christ. Uh, like the Hebrew Roots movement, they believe that Jesus is, is sort of like a, a replacement for the Old Testament sacrifices. But we keep the law and we trust Jesus as our sacrifice. Uh-uh. That was the error of the Galatians or those... The, the, the Judaizers that were teaching them. Paul says, if you, if you do that way, Christ will be of no benefit to you because your trust is not only in Christ. It's also in your works. And Galatians goes beyond just circumcision. If you're trusting in Christ plus works, like what John Piper started to preach after he retired, you're not saved by grace alone, through faith alone and Christ alone. He's a Judaizer. Don't listen to him. Don't listen to anybody that says you, you, you're not saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, but you also have to have works. Well, that's at, that, then you have to trust in your grace, in God's grace, plus your works. That's not trusting in Christ. You're saying Christ is not sufficient. Uh, they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. So in other words, if they repent of their unbelief, if they accept Jesus as their Messiah, as their atonement, they will be grafted back in because God is able to do it. Through faith. It's all about faith. Old Testament and New. For if you were cut off of the... Uh, olive tree, which is wild by nature. These crazy Scandinavians, where that come from? I guess there's some German mixed in there, too. What a combination. <sighs> I'm not anymore. I belong to him. New creation in Christ. <laughs> 
they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. And uh, if you were cut off out of the wild, out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature, into the cultivated, into a cultivated olive tree, God's olive tree, so you know you you're by nature part of that tree. Now you've been put into another tree, which is not entirely different. Otherwise, a graft wouldn't work. But so you're, you're not grafted into a pig. You're grafted into an olive tree, God's olive tree, a cultivated olive tree, a God a tree God takes care of. See, you were just out growing in the wild out there. You know what kind of fruit fruit trees that grow out in the wild are? What kind of fruit they have? Not very good. But you're a, a tree that's being cultivated by God. How much more will these, which are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Now, the agricultural example, again, a tree that has been for generations selected and pruned, and, you know, you take the best uh, offspring of that tree or the best, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, you take a, a, a snip it off and grow up another tree from it, uh, which essentially is a clone of that tree, uh, the best seed of a tree, and cultivate it over generations as opposed to a tree that's just growing out there in a fence row someplace doing its wild thing. Um, yeah, there's a big difference. But they're the same by nature. They're, they're very... We are, we are all sinners by nature. We are all children of Adam by human nature. But in God, we become new creatures. I, I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinions, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. What's the fullness of the Gentiles? What did Jesus tell his apostles to, go, to do? To go into all the world and preach the gospel to all nations. Make disciples out of all nations. The fullness of the of the Gentiles is when people come from every nation, tribe, and tongue. Not all people, but some people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. That's the fullness of the Gentiles. So, so we're talking about God's plan for his special people. His, the Israel of God, the church. The church of Jesus Christ. Which is both Jewish and Gentile, all made new in one. And so all Israel, Israel, uh, Jews plus Gentiles, is what I interpret this as, all Israel shall be saved. As, for, as it is written, a deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So there'll be a, 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 a repentance of unbelieving Israel after the fullness of, of all the Gentiles have come in. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. In other words, uh, God has, uh, well, in judgment and uh, other things, a partial hardening has come upon most Jews. Although, we see, of course, we see uh, Jews coming to faith in Christ. More so in the last couple of generations than there has been for millennia. Uh, so it's uh, God has not forgotten them, and that goes back to the beginning of this. They are God has not cast them off forever. They too will partake of Christ when they come to faith, but not until they come to faith in Christ. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. In other words, that the Gentiles might come in. See, God is God is working this out in such a way that the, the, the Gentiles can't boast against the Jews and the Jews can't boast against the Gentiles. It is planned. God is just. And far more than we are. So he had made promises to Abraham. He's not completely abandoning the promises to the fathers. 
But the believing ones will be saved. Without faith in Christ, there's no, there's no salvation for anyone. But concerning the election, the choice of God, they're beloved for the sake of the fathers because of the promises God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That some of, he's not going to, to have none of their natural descendants saved. Now again, of course, the, the, uh, the apostles and the early church was all Jewish. All of them. And Paul's talking about a remnant. They're the remnant of believing Israel. The Jews in the New Testament believe they're the remnant of the physical seed of Abraham. Without faith, there is no salvation, Old Testament or New. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet now have obtained mer uh, mercy through their disobedience, even so those who are now uh, have now been disobedient through the mercy uh, through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy in Christ, forgiveness in Christ. For God has committed them all, both Jews and Gentiles, to disobedience. Other places, God, it says, Paul writes that God has shut up all under sin and, and, this, and repeats the same uh, clause here in the second, that he might have mercy on all. Oh, the depths of the wis of both, both the, the depth of both the riches, excuse me, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Oh, there would be a sermon. Uh, how, how often have you told God what to do when you were praying to him? I've done it. Yes, he doesn't need our advice. Yet he puts up with it. Uh-huh. Or who has, who has first given to him, uh, and it shall be repaid to him. <laughs> yeah. Um, God is the source of everything. <laughs> he, for of him and through him and to him are all things. Uh, Paul also says this, of Christ. To whom be glory forever. Amen. Of course, Jesus is Yahweh, as he claimed to be. Uh, yeah. I, I wonder what the uh, the Muslims think of the doctrine of Trinity, or or Jews. One God, Father, Son, and Spirit. One God. And you should probably leave it that way. Don't try to uh, explain exactly how that's true. But yeah. We, we have to almost try sometimes, but it's one God. And this is his plan. And this is his plan for Jews and Gentiles. Continuity, yes, absolutely. Uh, believers in the Old Testament uh, are not do not have a different destiny than believers in the, in the New. And there is, as I mentioned before, this does explain that Ab Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and was glad. Why? Because he's waiting for the atonement. He was waiting to go into the very presence of God because he sought for a city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. So we find him in the New Testament in Jesus' story about uh, the rich man and Lazarus that, that Lazarus went to the bosom of Abraham. Where was Abraham? In paradise. We find this strange passage, I think it's in Matthew, where it talks about, um, or maybe Luke, where many uh, of the Old Testament saints apparently appear uh, when Jesus is, is crucified or, or at their resurrection. I don't remember the exact context off the top of my head, but the Old Testament saints appear and people see them. What's going on? Well, the scripture says he descended and brought captivity captive. He descended into hell, into, into Hades. And so what was captive in Hades? The Old Testament saints. 
the abode of the dead. Uh, Paradise was the, the, the abode of the righteous dead, and Tartarus was the abode of those that were being punished, like the rich man. I mean, the Scripture doesn't tell us a whole lot about this, but it does, Jesus verifies some of these ideas. So we have the righteous dead who were still unatoned for because the atonement of Christ hadn't occurred. They could not ascend into heaven. As Jesus said, no one has ascended from heaven except the Son, who who is of heaven, who is in heaven too, it's you know very. There's a claim of identity between him and and God right there. No one has descended except the Son, who is in heaven. So while he's on earth, he's also in heaven. So there's uh, we're getting into some sort of um, arcane scriptures here, but they're nevertheless the Word of God. So when he when it says he took captivity captive, they were still captive under the law, bound under the punishment of the law, and not able to come into the very presence of God because they were still in their sins, even though they had faith in God. Because the atonement hadn't happened yet. So once the atonement happened, then Christ took them with him and ascended into heaven. Or they, you know, they're exactly how we work out all those. We don't have to try to work out all those details. Don't get caught up in all the details. Just look at the overall picture. Because the people that are enemies of God, they want to point out little inconsistencies here and there. And they're not really inconsistencies. We just don't know all the details. And often they can be refuted very easily. So, uh, But if you're trying to look for that, you're not looking to understand what God is really saying and what he did. So I hope that helps. Again, read Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. Uh, read Hebrews, a little more difficult. And Galatians gets into the thing, too, uh, as far as that we're grafted into him. And because of Galatians and Hebrews both deal with the same issue of the gospel versus the law. And the fact that the law is obsolete. The law was temporary. And it's been fulfilled. Jesus said, I've not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. So the Jews, they, they can't go back to the law. It's gone. It's, an, it's I don't want to say annulled, but it's fulfilled. There's nothing to go back to. The covenant was temporary until Christ would come. He would fulfill the law. He would, he would uh, inherit all the blessings of the law. Plus, he would bear the punishment of the law upon himself for the sins of the entire world. So that anyone who comes to Christ, he's paid for their sins. But only in Christ do you actually have the atonement, because the atonement is in him just like eternal life is in Christ. To leave Christ is to leave eternal life behind. All the blessings of Christ, all the blessings of God, are in Christ. Apart from him, there is nothing. It's all in him. Which is why you have to believe in him. Why a Jew, an unbelieving Jew, somebody that believes in the law, cannot go to heaven. Well, through the law comes the knowledge of sin anyway. One of the problems with the rabbis is they, they cover over the law. They blind people to it. So th rather, you know, they, they, and they make excuses. They figure out ways around the law. Or it, see, what they do is, is they emasculate the power of the law. the law. The power of the law is to slay. It is to condemn you to death. That's his power. That's the only power it has. It's the ministry of death. The ministry of life is Jesus Christ. So when you realize the situation you're in, then you say, is there, is there another way? Yes, there is. God has already brought the Messiah. That is the other way. That is the way of life. But it's only in him. That's why it is a, a narrow gate and a narrow way, because that narrow gate and that narrow way 
is Christ himself. I hope that helps some people understand. That was actually pretty good. Thank you, Lord. Not that I have any particular wisdom, but yeah, I've tried to work through all these things through my life. So. And, you know, exactly what is the relationship here? What does the scripture say about always search the scriptures? Again, please go back and read Romans so you get the entire context. Preferably read it straight through. Ignore the the chapter divisions and ignore the paragraph divisions because because they weren't there originally. Uh, so they're, they're, those breaks aren't there. They've been inserted. It's it's one continuous thing from Romans nine through eleven. Read that, and again until you get it, and then to reference uh, Galatians and Hebrews because they're both related to the same issue you ask about. What is the relationship to Gentiles and the Jews and to the continuity between the church, Old Testament, and New? Of course there is. The continuity is God himself. Faith in God, that is the continuity. Same God. There's not a different God in the Old Testament and New. That's the continuity. Christ, who is the word of God who spoke to the prophets? And the word of God came saying, what do you think John says that, that, uh, in, first, in the Gospel of John? In the beginning was the word. What is what is the word? The word that came to the prophets. It's not Christ is in the Old Testament. The rock that that followed Israel. That's Christ. He was a source of the water of life. Then that's a picture, and a, a real reality too. It's not something that's just made up. Yes, there was a rock that followed them, that that poured out water. What do you? How do you feed? maybe 2 million people in the Sinai. Miracles. Manna. Who is the manna? Christ. It's a picture. These are reality, natural reality, that is a picture of the promise. The promised one, who is Christ himself. Okay. That, that was a little more than a short answer, but... Uh, it doesn't sufficiently cover the, the subject, but I think it's pretty good. Again, go back and read Romans 9, 10, and 11. And for anybody that wants to deal with this thing, all you dispensationalists, read Romans chapter 9, 10, 11, and Galatians, and Hebrews. And then slowly, once you find out, how do you, this is how you unwind dispensationalism or other false doctrines. These systems. Once you find out that the system doesn't fit the scripture, then you start trying to untangle it. It's, it's like having a, a mass of extension cords that are all balled up, you know, in a box. Sometimes it takes a while to get them untangled. That's our minds. Uh, but God will lead you into all truth. Please pray. Ask God. Say, I want to know the truth. What is the truth about our relationship to to Israel, natural Israel, and how, the Old Testament and the New? What What is the relationship? He has given it to you in the Scripture. Uh, he will lead you if you want to know the truth. And really, the, 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 the best way we learn is when God leads us into it. And so I, I can tell you but that's not what your confidence has to be in. It has to be in what God has actually said. And you turn to that in the scriptures. Okay? Well, this has been uh, actually quite uh, an easy video to do because I didn't have to do a whole lot of thinking. I already have the answers in the scriptures. In the scriptures. Just knowing where to look. Just knowing where to look. And again, I dealt with this years ago and said, ha, ah, dispensationalism is not right. And, and I've known that ever since. So, well, excuse me, wrong, wrong button. Where I'm not gone yet. So God bless you, and thank you for your questions, and I hope I was able to answer them. The easiest one was, why doesn't Israel do the shoot and scoot? Because they don't have to. Because they don't have anybody that can really harm them. It's a one-sided deal. <sighs> but yeah, uh, God bless uh, Israel too, and 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 Palestine. 
I mean, we should be in prayers for the Palestinian people. You have to remember, too, that there were an awful lot of Christian Palestinians that also have been and are being persecuted by Israel. So, you know, some of us Bible believers may not consider them really Christians, perhaps. You don't have to have perfect faith to be saved, just faith in Christ. If a little child can be saved by trusting in Jesus, they don't have to have perfect doctrine. What do they have to do? Jesus is a Savior. He died for my sins. I trust in him. That's sufficient. Anybody that does that. Too many people trust in something other than Christ, like their works, and or in addition to Christ, like their works or sacraments or the church. But a simple childlike faith, that'll save you every time. You don't have... None of us come uh, filled with, with true knowledge of Christ. <laughs> that comes after you're saved. So we come in darkness and ignorance, and we cry out out of our darkness and ignorance and our sin. God save me. And he does. He does indeed. 